Uh, I'm Mike Traugott, the director of the ICPSR Summer Program. Thank you for coming to this evening's uh, Blaylock Lecture. This is a series that we hold in honor of Tad Blaylock, who was an official representative to the consortium from the University of Washington uh, and uh, also a member of the Executive Council. We uh, have this year, this summer, a thread uh, of the Blaylock lectures that are related to estimating the outcome of elections because this, of course, is a presidential election year in the United States. And uh, tonight, uh, we have an expert on pre-election polls. He is a good friend of mine, Scott Teeter. He is a senior survey advisor at the Pew Research Center. In this role, he provides methodological guidance to all of the Pew Research Center's research areas. He's an expert on American public opinion and political behavior, a co-author of four books, including What Americans Know About Politics and Why It Matters, A New Engagement, Political Participation, Civic Life, and the Changing American Citizen, The Diminishing Divide, Religion's Changing Role in American Politics, and Uninformed Choice, The Failure of the New Presidential Nominating System. He's also published numerous articles on survey methodology. Prior to joining Pew Research Center, uh, Scott taught at George Mason University, Rutgers University, and Virginia Commonwealth University, where he also directed the Survey Research Center. Teeter is a graduate of Davidson College and received his doctorate in political science from the University of North Carolina. He's a past president of the American Association uh, for Public Opinion Research, APOR. And in 2016, uh, Scott won APOR's highest honor, the APOR Award for Lifetime Achievement for Outstanding Contributions to the Field of Public Opinion Research. So we are very pleased to have Scott with us this evening. And we're now going to turn the screen over to him. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for that nice introduction, Mike. I hope everybody's doing well, and uh, or, or at least as well as we can be under these circumstances. I'm coming to you from Arlington, Virginia, where there are thunderstorms about, so let's cross our fingers and hope that uh, the power and the internet connection uh, sticks around at least uh, till we can get this get this through. Um, I'm really pleased to have the chance to talk to you about election polling tonight. The season is heating up. We know that at Pew Research Center because we're beginning to get questions every day about the polls. Are they still good, et cetera? Let me say a little bit about Pew before I get started on the substantive part. Um, I'm, I'm currently a part-time employee at, at the Pew Research Center. Um, I retired from full-time work in 2016. Uh, Pew is a nonpartisan and nonprofit organization. We call ourselves a fact tank. We try to generate information that informs the public and policymakers, but we don't take uh, positions on issues and we don't make policy recommendations. And most important for those of you who are uh, either faculty or students, all of our research as well as the raw data that, that drives it is freely available on our website at pewresearch.org. Now, I do have to think that you, you may question the judgment of Professor Traugott in inviting me to talk about this subject, because back when I was the director of survey research at Pew, I was regularly attacked over the obviously flawed and biased polls that we put out. This particular guy, who has 211,000 Twitter followers, offered his opinion after a poll that we did show, that showed Obama ahead by quite a lot during the summer of 2012. He wasn't the only one. After we did a poll uh, that showed Rip Mitt Romney closing the gap after the first presidential debate, I got a, uh, well, let's say not so friendly personal phone call from uh, his pollster, Obama's pollster, a guy named Joel Benenson, who basically made the same point that David Birch did about my lack of competence. 
Um, as it turns out, I think at, that Benison actually had a pretty good point. And if anybody wants to hear the rest of the story, we can talk about it in the Q&A. At the Pew Research Center, we're still doing pre-election polls, but we've changed our focus a bit. Um, in 2016, we announced that we were, we were gonna make a change. Prior to that, we had typically conducted several polls during the campaign, concluding with a very large, what we called a forecasting poll the weekend before the election. And when we thought about things between 2012 and 2016, we decided to redirect some of the resources to doing a smaller number of much larger and deeper polls to try to explore the factors that were driving people's decisions about whether to vote and how to vote. We felt that the horse race focus was really not needed because a lot of other organizations were doing a good job with it. But we still ask people if they plan to vote and how, and we've de devoted a lot of resources to circling back after the election and doing deep dives on who did and who didn't vote and why. Our competitors are obviously interested in these things too. I'm not implying that we're doing the deep think and they're not because all of the organizations especially the news organizations and the academic organizations that are in this space are interested in more than just the horse race. Um, it's important to think about what an election poll can tell us beyond something that we're gonna learn on election day or maybe this year or a few days after election day. Why are people making the choices they are? What issues are important to them? Does the winning candidate ultimately have a mandate from the public to pursue a particular set of policies? Who was motivated to vote? Who was not motivated? Who was motivated but wasn't able to vote either because they lacked the knowledge that they needed to, to vote or the lack of time, or because they were thwarted by the rules or some kind of intimidation. So those are the things that, that we're interested in trying to answer about elections. But lest you think we got out because we worried that it was gonna get harder to call elections correctly, we actually were pretty good at it uh, before we before we stopped. Um, but I, I just to be honest, I think any successful successful election pollster would tell you that the business is part science, hopefully a good part science, part art that is judgment and hunch and so forth, and partly just sheer luck. Just as an example, one one of these years, one of the years that we did extremely uh, well. Uh, we did, as we always do, commissioned identical surveys on the weekend before the election with two different polling uh, contractors, both using the exact same methods. If we had used either one of those alone, we would have been badly wrong. In one case, getting the outcome of the election wrong, and the other overstating this, the um, margin of victory. But when we put the two uh, polls together, which is what we always did, the result was perfect. So I think we were wise to do what we did, but we were also really lucky. In addition to doing election polls, we're keenly interested in the methodology of all polling and survey research, and we spend a lot of time at the center trying to evaluate and improve approaches to measuring uh, public opinion. This slide just shows you uh, sort of headlines from several of our recent uh, reports that you might find interesting, uh, both about general survey methods and with respect to elections. And I'm happy to talk about any of this when we get to the Q&A. All right, well, the first thing I'd like to get out of the way is the question of whether election polling is accurate. So first of all, let us, let us look upon this picture of, of uh, Harry Truman uh, laughing at the headline that says he's lost uh, to Tom Dewey. Every pollster that I know has this photograph framed and hanging somewhere in their house or office. It, it's our favorite uh, universal amulet, um, or at least it's a reminder that we're fallible. And so, you know, we, we always remind ourselves, that, you know, the next election we could be wrong. Of course, we have a more contemporary example of polling failure than 1948 to keep us humble. Um, no doubt about it. Polling's reputation took a huge hit in 2016. Um, even though I think much of the immediate post-election criticism that you see uh, on this uh, collage was really kind of overblown. So let's, let's dig a little deeper into this, shall we? Um, 
first of all, let's just admit it. The fact is the state polling in 2016 really had problems in places like Michigan, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Um, the average error rate was higher in 2016 than it had been in the last several elections. And the errors were typically all in the same direction, overstating Hillary Clinton's chances. We have a pretty good understanding of those errors, thanks to the hard work of, of an APOR task force that had been put together even before the election to evaluate the performance of the polls. But the fact is, if you look at this, this is um, just what we're looking at here. Um, this is a three point error in the democratic direction and a 5.1 point overall absolute error. And you can see that in previous elections, the errors were smaller. But there are a couple of things about this chart that are worth uh, not, not losing sight of. First, you know, even looking at this record over the past five elections, one pattern jumps out, and that is that the direction of the errors has bounced back and forth between errors favoring the Republican candidate and errors favoring the Democratic candidate. There's really nothing here to, to suggest that there's a consistent tilt in the polls towards one party or the other. Well, we don't really have a time for a full postmortem, but I think it would be useful to look at a couple of the possible explanations for what happened in 2016. One thing that's probably familiar to many of you if you've paid attention to the postmortems and some of the analysis that's happened since then, some of the discussions that are going on now, is that one of the most important reasons the polls failed in some states was the failure to account for the sizable share of the non-college white voters in the public, especially in the states that turned out to be the problems. Um, the uh, the New York Times reporter Nate Cohn wrote a very prescient piece in the Times in the middle of the summer in 2016, making the point that many surveys, including the exit polls from previous presidential elections, were overstating the educational level of the voting public. And that could translate into trouble if the proper correlations showed up. Well, Unfortunately for polling, they did. For a long time, educational attainment among white voters was not strongly correlated with partisan preferences uh, among white voters. If anything, better educated white voters were more Republican than their less educated counterparts. One consequence was that, that um, not all election pollsters felt the need to weight their data on education to make sure that their samples matched the population on that particular characteristics. And as you know, if you do surveys, your samples tend to overrepresent better educated people. That's just one of the biases that we have to deal with. We usually deal with it through weighting. But the pattern of the association between education and uh, whether you're a Democrat or Republican began to change after Obama's election. And a sizable rep Republican advantage opened up among non-college whites, while college-educated whites began trending in the opposite direction. 2016 was the first election in which this really mattered, and it is absolutely essential that election polls now be weighted by some estimate of the likely composition of, of the electorate on education. Yet despite the problems that we saw in 2016, not all of them are, are doing so. Some have changed, but not all of them. The other issue in 2016 that appeared to be really important were disproportionate swings by late deciders favoring Donald Trump, and particularly in the places it mattered, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and the others on this list. Normally in an election, the undecideds will tend to break relatively evenly between uh, the two candidates. Now, there are exceptions to that pattern, but something like what I'm showing you here, which comes from the exit polls uh, from 2016, is very unusual. Moreover, there were a lot of undecided voters at this stage in the campaign. What, what that means in practical terms is that people had polling that might have been fairly accurate at the time they were taken, let's say several days before the election. And then on election day, people tell, told the exit pollsters 
in the last week that they made up their minds. And, you know, by margins of like two to one, they were breaking uh, towards Donald Trump. One of the reasons that this might have happened is that both candidates were very unpopular. The exit polls found that nearly one in five voters said that they had an unfavorable opinion of both candidates. That's four times as large as it was in 2012. People who don't like both candidates tend to be more likely to be undecided. Now, so you have a lot of undecideds. What's the mechanism that drove them to Trump? We don't know the answer to that. Some people say, well, it was the Comey letter. Some people say, well, a lot of them were already Trump supporters, but didn't want to admit it uh, and hid that from pollsters. For what it's worth, neither of those explanations seems to bear up under the scrutiny of the APOR task force, but they still have a lot of people who subscribe to them, and I, I couldn't rule them out uh, definitively. Okay, well, let's pull away from the states for a minute and take a broader look. Uh, here, the news is a little better. If you do the same kind of analysis of errors, and in this case, going back from 2016 all the way to the dawn of polling in 1936, the national polling in 2016 was quite accurate. It overstated uh, Hillary Clinton's margin by a percentage point, which is less than the national polls underestimated Barack Obama's margin of victory in 2012. And in the 2018 elections, the national polling that asked what's called the generic House question, are you going to vote for the Democrat or the Republican for the U.S. House of Representatives, those polls were very accurate. Now, granted, there were errors in Senate races in 2018 that suggest uh, that the problems in state polling that we saw in 2016 haven't been completely solved yet. Georgia in particular and Florida were both places where gubernatorial races and Senate races tended to uh, come out uh, on not like the polling had forecast uh, with Republicans winning when Democrats had been favored. Um, but I think the bigger picture from this review is that we, we don't have a methodology that's crashing and burning. We have some problems, but it's not, um, it's not a catastrophe like it seemed to a lot of people in the aftermath of the 2016 election. And if we take an even broader view of this, uh, there was a systemic analysis of, uh, of polling accuracy around the world in over 75 years with a database of 31,000 polls. Um, and it shows remarkable stability in the accuracy of polls. This is the average uh, absolute error going all the way back to 1940. And you see there's no trend line there. There's no upward movement in errors. You have you know, some individual elections in the past 20 years where there have been a lot of errors. But the fact is, uh, we see a, a lot of stability um, in this. Um, and that's, a, that's an encouraging thing, because this is not, you know, the, the issue of getting elections right in polls is not just a, a U.S. issue. All right, well, let's turn now and talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how election polling gets done. So why is the record generally good? Well, I would argue that the profession has taken a very systematic and scientific approach to dealing with the challenges, and that approach has generally paid off, despite the occasional misfires and the changing landscape and environment that we, we have for polling these days, which all of you who think about surveys are familiar with, growing non-response and the like. In thinking about how election polling is done and what, what we need to ensure accuracy, one way to think about it is the total survey error perspective. Um, this you know, gives you a way to break down the component parts of what the survey is trying to accomplish. And when you do that, you see that uh, election surveys are just like any other kind of survey. You gotta get a sample that's representative of the inferential population and you have to accurately measure something important about that sample. In this case, uh, who's going to vote and how are they going to vote? Pretty straightforward, right? Well, here's, here's uh, a little bit more detail. Let's start with representation or what are sometimes called errors of non-observation. 
Does your sampling frame cover the population of interest? Um, random digit dial samples as recently as 2004 presidential election didn't cover people who were cell phone only. Now they were less than 10% of voters back then, so there weren't enough of them to really create biases in the polls, but we got questions about the issue even in that year. You know, by, by 2008, the share had grown substantially, and of course now a majority of Americans are cell phone only. So if you're not doing cell phone calling in your telephone election survey, you're missing an important part of the population and biasing your, your samples. What about sampling from voter lists? Um, but for, for phone surveys, what do you do if there's no phone number on the voter list? Um, and then there's a question of who do uh, opt-in non-probability samples cover? Certainly not people who don't use the internet. So coverage is an important consideration to think about. Fortunately, for most kinds of polls, we, we do a pretty good job of it. Then there's non-response error. We've already talked a little bit about it um, in, in the context of samples getting too many well-educated people. Um, you know, in addition to that, we get too many older people, we get too many politically engaged people. Not all of these biases are gonna hurt, but many of them will. The big worry is whether they're correlated with partisanship, and many, like education, are. And then there's always sampling error. Um, you know, the stakes are, are highest for pre-election polls in close elections. And with the typical sample sizes that people are, are using in polls today, if the race is within a couple of points, it's impossible to be confident that one candidate is leading the other one. Turning to measurement, it would seem like, you know, questions of interest are pretty straightforward. Are you gonna vote? Who are you gonna vote for? Um, but there's some hidden traps here. We know that many more people say they're going to vote than actually do so. Some of this is just social desirability, presentation of yourself as, as somebody who's civically engaged. Some of it is just over-promising. I do think of myself as civically engaged and I intend to vote, but then, you know, something comes up and I can't. So what I tell you in the poll may not be what I do, and it's usually in the direction of me not actually showing up if I've said I'm going to. But there are errors the other way. Quite a few people end up voting despite saying that they don't plan to. And something that we understand well in other surveys, context effects from the order of questions, that also matters in election polling. Typically, for that reason, we try to ask the vote choice question early in the survey before any substantive policy or attitude question so that we don't prime respondents or frame the choice. Now, campaign pollsters may do that kind of priming because they wanna see what kind of messages would actually help their, help their candidates. But the kind of uh, polling that we at Pew Research Center and news organizations and academic institutions do, unless you're doing an experiment of some kind, you typically don't want to prime the answers that you get from people. Um, one of the practical choices that affects measurement um, is, you know, whether you're going to ask about minor party candidates. Um, in general, respondents are going to express greater support for minor party candidates than they'll actually receive on election day. Um, but for candidates who've actually achieved access to the ballot in most states and have at least some campaign infrastructure, you may need to list them. So that's a choice that you have to make. Uh, one of the clearest examples of this is, is uh, some very specialized research that's been done on ballot propositions where people are voting on whether to make a law in effect. Now, a lot of this research shows that in these instances, you need to provide the respondent with the exact text that's going to be on the ballot that they see when they go into the voting booth or vote on, by mail, uh, rather than a summary or a paraphrase. And you know, in, that, in this instance, people who do self-administered surveys obviously have an advantage to, to achieving that. The presence or absence of an interviewer is another factor. Um, with a live interviewer, um, you know, you can get reactions from the respondents um, if there is any social stigma attached to a candidate. 
or even a particular appeal. I'll give you an example. Um, I polled in the 1989 Virginia gubernatorial election when Douglas Wilder, a Democratic African American, was elected by less than a percentage point. My poll and many others conducted that year showed him winning by a much wider margin. This was at the time characterized as what's called a manifestation of the Bradley effect, named after the Los Angeles mayor, Tom Bradley, a, an African American Democrat who lost his race for governor in 1982 after leading in the polls. The theory was that some white voters said they'd support him but didn't do so or said they were undecided and ended up voting for the Republican. This has been observed in other elections, especially in the late 80s, like the 1989 one in Virginia. But the phenomenon seems to have vanished. Um, you can't really find evidence of it in the 90s. And of course, in, in um, 2008, we were very worried about a recurrence of it with Barack Obama as the Democratic nominee. But the polling in 2008 turned out to be extremely accurate. Um, and polling's failure to predict Trump's victory in 2016 is sometimes attributed to a similar phenomenon. But the APOR task force looked deeply into this and really didn't find any evidence for it. Still, you hear a lot of people say, hey, I know there are a lot of people that are out there that are going to vote for Trump, but they're not going to tell anybody that they're going to do it. So we'll see. One final note to this discussion of measurement challenges is kind of mundane. What do you do with the undecided in a poll? This is an example of a choice that you make and how you analyze your data. You've gathered the data. You've got these people who won't tell you how they're going to vote. They say they're going to vote, but they don't tell you how. They say they hadn't made up their minds. <clears throat> you can throw them away, which essentially is like allocating them proportionally between the, can the other candidates. Um, you can divide them equally between the other candidates, assuming that they're just choosing randomly. And that approach has some empirical support. You can, um, you can even model their likely vote based on their answers to other questions. Or you can do some of those things and you can try what we used to, <laughs> used to do that my old boss, Andrew Kohut, called the whiny leaner question, which is basically an entreaty that the um, interviewer makes to the respondent, oh, please, please, my supervisor really wants to, to get answers to this question from everybody. Can't you just help me out and, and tell me who you think you might vote for? I don't think there's any evidence that that was a particularly good way to do it, but uh, we always laughed about the whiny leaner question. So let's shift gears for a minute and take a look at what the landscape is for, for election polling. What kind of polls are out there? One way to think about this is by the mode of interview, telephone polls, both live and robocalls, internet, mail, face-to-face, -face, text messages. Um, there are all kinds of modes. All of these were used in the 2016 presidential election, though the face-to-face -face component of one of them, the American National Election Study, um, has been canceled this year. Um, that study uh, for, for, for 2020, funded by the NSF, was led by scholars at the University of Michigan and Stanford, um, and it's all going to be done um, by other modes this year and not using face-to-face -face interviews. Another way to think about this question of what kind of polls are out there is what kind of samples are being used? And here are the choices are basically twofold. The general public, and you get that sample and then you weed it down to the registered voters and the likely voters. And you can do that with either random digit dialing or you can use a mail type sample with address based sampling. Um, or you can, you can do it with non-random samples in opt-in survey panels. Or the alternative are registered voter lists drawn from official records. And the modes and the samples that we're talking about here can be mixed and matched. And one study I'll talk about at the end uses most of the approaches that I've mentioned here simultaneously in various combinations uh, in order to achieve its goals. So let's take a quick tour through some examples of polls that are out there. So live telephone polling is still pretty popular. Now we at Pew have moved away from it. 
we found it extremely expensive and uh, have decided to cast our lot with a different method, which I'll describe momentarily. But many of the best known names in the business, including, including most of the major network and cable TV uh, polling organizations, as well as other news organizations, and university survey centers are doing live polling. And you probably find these uh, with, a, with a pretty good distribution of random digit dialing, RDD, and registered voter lists, RBS is sometimes called. One type of telephone survey that's out there um, uh, that has gained some uh, attention is uh, recorded telephone or IVR polls or robo polls, you might know them. These typically sample from voter files, obtain landline phone numbers, and then conduct these IVR interviews with them. You can see a, a sample questionnaire or piece of a questionnaire there. Um, so one thing about these is that they tend to have short questionnaires um, and you don't really have any control over who's responding to them. I suppose that's true for online surveys, but um, the fact is on the IVR polls, you, you're really in the dark about who's taking the poll and you just have to trust them to, uh, to answer honestly when they press the different keys or give a voice response. Now, these, um, these robo polls typically will combine with another method because <clears throat> they can't automatically dial the cell phone population. And so they will usually do either text messaging to cell phones or they'll use some kind of opt-in online that helps them cover the cell phone only population. Another very popular method these days are online probability panels. This is the method that we're using now. We have a, a, a panel called the American Trends Panel that um, a lot of, um, a, a lot, most of our domestic work is being done on. And a number of organizations are doing it and this list is growing. The Associated Press, um, the Los Angeles Times works with the University of Southern California in a panel that they have. ABC News and the Washington Post for some of their surveys, telephone for, for, for some of their surveys. Um, these panels tend to be fairly cost effective after you've uh, spent the money to stand them up um, and you can get very large samples with them. And so they have some attractive property. You can also link them to voter files more easily than you can, let's say a, um, an RDD sample. And then finally, there are the online opt-in polls. This is the wild west of polling um, where the barriers to entry are very low. It's very cheap to do these polls. Maybe not cheap to do them well, but, it, but you, can, you can get in the business for a few hundred or maybe just a couple of thousand dollars. Um, and the methodologies that are employed by them vary quite a lot. Um, as with other types of election polls, these often feature partnerships between news organizations and the polling organizations, but it's very hard to characterize the approaches and the accuracy of the polling in this sector. Given that they don't start from a known population, modeling on the back end of, of the sample is what's really essential to getting uh, a good model of the, of the population to make them representative. Now, some of them are using uh, extra efforts to try to uh, improve the sampling on the front end. Some of them, like uh, YouGov, for example, create a synthetic sampling frame and use matching to build a sample that looks like the population on a number of dimensions. Others, like SurveyMonkey, are able to leverage the large volume of um, users that they have um, of their software to launch surveys to a pretty diverse group. Uh, but many pollsters in this space aren't very transparent about their methods and they don't have a track record. So this is really a caveat emptor uh, part of the election polling sector. Let me double back to the question of RDD samples and registered voter phone samples. We, we decided we wanted to try an experiment um, 
with these um, a couple of years ago. How do you decide if you're going to use an RDD or a voter file sample if you're going to do a phone survey? If all you're interested in are the voters, I think one could argue that RBS, the registered voter sample, is probably the way to go. Um, it's most assuredly the way to go if you're trying to survey in a sub-state level, like uh, a congressional district or a city, because it's so very hard to do RDD uh, calling into that kind of concentrated geographic area. The case can even be made that state level polling is better with RBS, especially states where you have a lot of people living there who may have phone numbers, cell phone numbers uh, from out of state. But what if you're interested in the general public as well? For example, trying to understand why some people aren't registered and how to get them to register. Doesn't RDD have a, an advantage in that situation? So we decided to run an experiment in which we would pit an RDD and an RBS national sample against each other. Um, and I have to say the results surprised us. Um, for all intents and purposes, the battle was a, a draw with each type of sample outperforming the other on a couple of metrics. And the sample is really very comparable um, on others. So let's start the top here, coverage rates, that is share of the population, Advantage goes to RDD there because the RBS samples tended to not have phone numbers for a lot of the cases that you sampled off the file. Fortunately, for people using RBS samples, that's a problem that is diminishing as more and more phone numbers are showing up on the voter files. The demographics um, of the obtained sample, unweighted, um, you know, looked very much like the samples that we always get, uh, including for RBS. But actually, the problems of overrepresentation of, of um, older and better educated voters were worse with the RBS sample than with, than with the RDD sample. Now, that is a problem that you can, you can mitigate somewhat by designing your sample in advance using information that's on the voter file. Um, it may make your calling less efficient, but um, it's a way of avoiding having to wait so heavily on the back end. Okay, so where did the RBS sample do better? Well, it did better on costs. It's just a more efficient way of calling people. Um, it, it, you know that the chances are pretty good that the number is attached to something that's working, whereas with, with RDD, you don't know that. Um, and so it was less costly. Um, and this is a big one for people doing election polling. The RBS samples allow you to assess your non-response error on critical characteristics like partisanship. You know who you're calling. And if you don't get as many of one group uh, as are in the, the original sample, then you've got non-response bias and you can use information from the frame or from the sample itself as a weighting variable to help uh, correct for that bias. And then there were a few characteristics, response rates, and basically the accuracy in terms of bias on a whole range of types of estimates where the samples were essentially the same. And that surprised us. So basically, we found that a registered voter sample that includes people who are not registered, something that the companies are now providing, ended up giving us something that looked very much like our RDD samples. Okay, well, let's, let's take on the big challenge here. This is the question of who's going to vote. This is one of the most difficult things that we have to do in election polling. You know, imagine that you've done everything right up to the point of deciding who in your sample you're going to include when you estimate the horse race. It can all fall apart right here. The fundamental problem stems from trying to model a population that doesn't exist at the time you have to do it. You're talking about people and what they're going to do in the future. And that, that group, the size and the shape and composition of the electorate is going to be affected by numerous factors 
that are both internal and external to the individuals in your sample. You know, many of us consider voting an easy thing to do, but for a lot of people, especially young people who are unfamiliar with the rules and procedures of voting, the deadlines and the like, or people who've recently moved, it's not so easy. Um, and so what they think they're going to do or intend to do may run up against the realities of them not being able to comply with the rules. Plus, there are just a lot of uncertainties about what election day is going to bring. You know, everybody in the polling world thinks about the weather as a confounding factor, but this year, oh boy, what is election day going to look like for people that want to vote in person? You know, and, and then there's just the question of people not being very good judges of their future behavior. And you can see why this is one of the parts of the polling process that is as much art as it is science. So we, we tried to do some research on this uh, in an effort to understand it better ourselves and to help others. Uh, my colleague Ruth Galnick and I um, did a, a postmortem of the 2014 general election survey that we did uh, with our American Trends panel. We matched the post-election survey with the voter file so that we could figure out who it actually turned out. And from this position of omniscience, that is knowing who did and who didn't, we looked at the questions that we had asked people before the election and the prior information that we might have about the panelists and tried to figure out what combination of all of that would give us the best insight into who would eventually vote. The bottom line is it wasn't really very pretty. I'm not gonna take you through all of the gory details, but let, let's just take a look at a few things. First off, among the registered voters in the sample, um, the Democratic House candidates led by 42 to 38, this figure right here. So this is the pre-election House vote intention among registered voters. But of course, the Republicans in 2014 ended up winning a lot of seats. They carried the total vote by about five points. So instead of a four point Democratic advantage, the final result was a five point Republican advantage or a nine point swing on the margin. Turnout in 2014 was extremely low, especially among the Democrats. Um, and this, Democrat, this, this graphic shows exactly what happened here. These are Republicans, 73% of them voted. So you take that number and multiply it times that number. 61% of the Democrats voted times that number. And you can see where some of the erosion occurred um, of the Democratic advantage. There was also some changing of minds that ended up helping the Republicans, mostly from people who were undecided or were supporting someone other than the, one of the two major party candidates. And you know, the question is, could we have figured all of this out from the pre-election survey doing what pollsters usually do? So how do you do that? The typical approach is you ask a few questions about interest in the election, knowledge of where to vote or how to vote, uh, whether you voted in the past, do you intend to vote this time? This approach is one that was developed decades ago by George Gallup's election expert, a guy named Paul Perry. And his, his basic approach here was to take a bunch of questions like this, and these are actually the exact questions, more or less, um, that he used. And you create a scale, an additive index of, of, of them. Uh, and then you put everybody in your sample on that scale. Um, and you use that to create a kind of cutoff point with everybody above the cutoff point being deemed to be a a likely voter and everybody below it being to be a non-voter. So how does that work in practice? So the scale ranges here from zero to seven. This is the score on the scale. Of all the registered voters that we interviewed in the pre-election survey, this is the share that fell into each of these um, categories. So at the very top of the things, you know, you get the point for every question, you're interested, you intend to vote, you voted in the past, you know where to vote, et cetera. 
that was about half of all the registered voters. And it drops off from there. Then with the, with the verification using the voter file, we're able to, to see exactly what share of people in each of these categories voted. 83% of the people at the top of the list actually turned out to vote and it drops off from there. But when you actually look at what, what's happened here, you do, you do, if you say, take the top two categories and you say 63% of the registered voters are gonna turn out, you end up capturing about 78% um, of all the actual verified voters. But a fifth of the voters um, who you excluded uh, did not, you know, they actually showed up to vote even though you didn't think they would. And so that's where some error can creep in. Now this scale is quite powerful because in a typical election, um, it is highly correlated with uh, the partisan outcomes. And so where you set the cutoff, how big or small the turnout you think will actually be, um, really matters in terms of what your forecast is gonna be. So this is, your, your, if you forecast that it's gonna be 45% of, of the RVs, you would have forecast a five point Republican victory. And as you go up in turnout to up to 60%, you end up with a tied race, again, based on what we observe to be true about people. Now, the 2014 election had one of the lowest turnouts um, in a long time. In fact, the lowest in the last 70 years. And that really helped the Republicans. We didn't make a forecast that year, but if we had, I doubt that we would have based it on such an, a low assumption. And so we might've been pretty wrong about the, about the outcome. It's also the case that if you add information um, into, the, uh, into the model beyond just the seven questions, uh, you might be able to improve uh, your forecast. One of the most important pieces of information is uh, the past voting history, and not just the respondent's word for it. If you bring that in, as we do in this section here, you end up with different models giving you um, different you know, different advantages for the Republicans, but pretty much an advantage for the Republicans in all of these, whereas just using the, uh, the questions in the survey, you, you, don't, you don't have the Republican advantage that we know actually ended up happening. If we were to apply this kind of modeling to the 2018 election, it would have been very different because the turnout in 2018 was 49%, which was the highest in an off-year election in 100 years. The Republicans turned out, but so did the Democrats. They were even more energized and they won back the House. So, you know, if we had used the 2014 model to guide our 2018 prediction, it wouldn't have worked very well. Let me wrap up here with a quick overview of two very interesting and creative election poll efforts uh, from this, from, from 2018 and that are going to be repeated in 2020. If you're interested in, in these, you definitely want to read more about them because I think they have taken um, both in their own way the wisdom, uh, the accumulated wisdom of uh, the research that I've talked about and applied it, not just our research, but from, from everybody who's doing work in this sector and applied it um, to, to create some really interesting products. So, um, one of them is the New York Times Siena College poll series, and the other is the AP VoteCast project, which is done in conjunction with NORC at the University of Chicago. Um, so this is a kind of a schematic overview of the two. They're, they're, they're both trying to do different, they're trying to do different things and they're using different methods to do them. Um, but, they, but they're really, I think, quite interesting. So let's start with the Times poll. It's a large scale effort to poll nearly all of the competitive House and Senate races in 2018, and in some cases more than, more than once during the, during the fall election. They did about 100 phone surveys using voter file samples. The sample sizes were small, about 500. Um, 
but they ended up with a very good track record and they definitely didn't cut corners on this study other than the sample size, which they did for reasons of practicality more than money, I think, uh, which is an interesting lesson considering the choices that you have to make to how to allocate the funds that you have if you're doing something like this. The VoteCast study was an effort to create a new version of the exit polls, which I think many of you heard about last week from Dan Merkel, except there's no exit um, in this poll. It was a large pre-election survey designed to provide estimates to the media clients, just the way the NEP exit polls are, on election day. Um, this one draws from multiple methodologies. They used voter files for the sample, um, they use panelists from their NORC Amerispeak panel. They use large numbers of panelists from opt-in samples. And for the probability component of the study, they mailed postcards to the voter file sample, encouraging people to go to the web to take the survey. They called people using the numbers that they had on the voter file, and they took inbound calls. They also had a gigantic non-probability sample that they melded with the probability cases. I'm not going to go into the technical details here, but it's really quite a clinic to read them. Um, for example, the New York Times Siena study used disproportionate stratification of the voter file uh, to try to get more hard to reach uh, respondents, recognizing that these are also people who are less likely to turn out. But at the same time, they selected on turnout propensity to try to balance that out and make the survey more efficient. Um, the VoteCast project also used stratification to achieve a more representative sample, but didn't do it in the way that the Times Siena project did. The weighting of the two studies was, uh, was similar in some respects in that they both used a lot of variables. Um, and one difference is that the, that the VoteCast study, because it was bringing in non-probability sample to try to build up the sample size, um, needed to adjust the non-probability cases so that they looked like the probability cases. And they used um, a, a kind of, uh, uh, they, they used a type of calibration weighting in order to achieve that. Then they also, because they were needing to provide small area sub-state estimates, um, they used uh, small area estimation modeling to, to do that. Um, they both tried to model the likely electorate. Um, the vote, VoteCast project developed 12 different models with some questions. Uh, they ended up deciding that the different models didn't make much difference in the, in the substantive results. Um, the New York Times poll did a lot of interesting things. They confronted the problem that, that I described a mo moment ago, that the 2014 data and the characteristics of who turned out then were not going to be a good guide to 2018. They learned that pretty clearly from the special elections that had happened in 2017. Um, and so they actually adjusted some of the turnout estimates based on a, what they called a Virginia adjustment that looked at the uh, patterns of turnout in the Virginia 2017 off-year elections in order to make their results more accurate. So this is what um, the products looked like. Uh, they're very different. The VoteCast uh, thing was provided to various media clients. This is the Fox News page that, that's on their website, and it's a whole series of crosstabs that goes on and on and on and on. It's a really interesting set of data. They've also made their data available online. You can download it and analyze it yourself. Um, the New York Times, on the other hand, took the approach that they wanted to use the um, effort not just as something that would support their reporting and their reporters in covering the election, but they also wanted it to be kind of didactic. They wanted it to, to help educate the public about polling methodology. So here is a typical um, cover screen for um, what they were, what they did when they were reporting on the Washington 8th Congressional District. They ran the poll. They made 32,000 calls. They had 477 interviews. Um, here's a link to get to the methodology. And they said it was a close race. Well, this turned out to be a pretty accurate 
uh, pick because um, the, the Democrat won, won this election. But here's something all, they also did. They, they showed the results live as the interviewing was happening. They showed uh, updated charts as interviews were completed and added to the data set and reweighted in real time. And so this graph here started out as a little a short graph and gradually grew. And you can see that early on, the um, Republican was leading, but as they got up past 100 cases, it got to be more even. And then finally, once they got closer to 500, the Democrat pulled ahead and the line, <clears throat> excuse me, was pretty flat there. This is a page where they show, here's different turnout estimates and what would the result be if this, this, or this condition obtained. And here they show you how many calls it took to each demographic characteristic, things they knew from the voter file, in order to get their quota of respondents. And it's, it's kind of depressing to get young people 18 to 29, their um, number of interviews they got was 49 and, and that was one out of every 89 that they tried to reach. Whereas older voters, one out of every 33 actually was reachable and granted them an interview. Well, 2020 is here. Um, we're already seeing dozens of polls each week. I hope this overview will help you be a more savvy consumer of uh, polls. We certainly plan to write about the polls, not just ours, but from time to time about um, how polls are being done and what issues we see with them. Um, so we hope you'll sign up for our newsletters and follow us on social media. And I appreciate your attention and I'll be delighted to answer your questions. Thanks a lot, Scott, for a very interesting presentation. If you uh, stop sharing your screen, we'll get you uh, filling up the screen as you answer these questions. Uh, and as you know, uh, those who are uh, participating, uh, you can ask your questions in the Q&A or in, in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll uh, moderate those and, and address the questions to Scott. While, while the questions are coming in, let me ask you a, a, a question for starters, Scott. Um, for people who do pre-election polls uh, and have to produce an estimate of the election outcome, obviously it involves a lot of assumptions. Sometimes they're made explicit, but you know, rarely there are. They are. And, and one of the basic assumptions is how, how will this election look like the last similar one? And uh, you know, it's just a starting point. And then pollsters have to make adjustments. Um, but we're, we're in an unusual time now with the current president and the state of the pandemic and so on. What are your thoughts about how the 2020 election might be the same as and different from the 2016 election? Well, that is the, that is the challenge that pollsters have to, have to confront. And I think that um, that example that <clears throat> I gave of thinking about the 2014 election, which was a almost record low turnout compared with the 2018 election is sort of an example of what we're dealing with here. It's not quite as extreme as that because presidential years typically don't have as much oscillation in the turnout, but the same phenomenon is present. You have the, um, you have to make some adjustments for what you think the level of engagement is going to, to be. And you don't have necessarily the most scientific tools to, to do that with. If I were in the position of having to come up with turnout estimates and the kind of calculations that I was describing to you from previous elections, I think I would look to the 2018 election and say, 
here was here was an election that was an off year election and yet it had a turnout level that was almost presidential in its magnitude that would tell me that this year we would have probably one of the highest presidential year turnouts that we've ever seen because it's clear that people who like Donald Trump like him a lot and they feel a sense of loyalty to him and they feel some sense of threat um, from the possibility that he would lose. Um, and at the same time, the animosity towards him by Democrats is equally off the charts. And so I think that you, you would, if, if we left the story there, would say there's going to be um, a bonkers, uh, that's a technical term, turnout this, this November. But I think we're in a very, um, I think we're in a very, very tough situation here to forecast what's really going to happen. We know that the machinery of American elections is not all that well um, oiled. We've seen that in a number of elections within 2018 and 2019, long lines at polling places and, and the like. And now you have the COVID-19 problem where polling places uh, are, are, there are not going to be as many of them. Poll workers who tend to be older uh, Americans are reluctant to expose themselves to a, to a stream of people coming through. Um, and so, governments are probably going to have to cut back. There's a lot of talk and action, excuse me, on the front of trying to expand mail voting, but I think we've also seen that mail voting is uh, particularly for states that haven't been doing it. And some states like California and Oregon and others have been doing it and they've got it down. But um, you, you know, there, there are going to be problems. And so I think all of that puts a huge amount of uncertainty into the election forecast. Um, that's not a fully satisfying answer, but that's that's what the picture looks like to me at this point. So we have uh, uh, one one uh, question and comment uh, about the Perry Gallup index, uh, which is that it, this index is really interesting. Is there a similar index for races that are affected by gerrymandering? Well, gerrymandering um, shouldn't necessarily challenge the working of the of the Perry Gallup index if if you've actually reached the people who are living in the gerrymandered district. Um, in other words, you're if people know that they live in a district, um, you you. Um, you know, you run the numbers the same way you would otherwise. I think how it could make a difference is is that gerrymandered districts, particularly if they're really badly gerrymandered, tend to have lopsided outcomes. And those lopsided outcomes, polls have trouble forecasting accurately. Um, elections that are runaways um, in one direction or the other often tend to have some polling errors that are larger than the average polling errors that you see in more competitive races. <clears throat> That's partly a function of the fact that people who are in gerrymandered districts or in races that aren't competitive because of the quality of one candidate or the other may know that the race isn't competitive and they may be less motivated to vote. Um, so I think that is the way in which the Perry Gallup method or any of these methods can fall short in a gerrymandered district. Uh, with regard to the uh, Perry Gallup index, when you showed uh, the chart of alternative ways of calculating turnout, uh, you you showed uh, the difference between the uh, the Perry Gallup index, which is essentially a cutoff model. You, you keep the data for some respondents and you throw away the data for others. Whereas in the logistic regression models, everybody's preference counts, but it's essentially weighted 
uh, by their likelihood of voting. This is a source of uh, differentiation between pollsters and uh, polling companies. W what is your assessment of the difference or the utility of the cutoff and the regression type models of estimating turnout, the likely electorate? We've been using the, the cutoff method. I mean, we're not doing likely voter modeling anymore, but and before we stopped, we were, we were um, very much in the Gallup model. Um, Andy Kohut, who was our president, had been the president of the Gallup organization. He had studied his um, polling methodology with Paul Perry, and he was an advocate of, of the cutoff method. But um, you're, you're right that um, that's not the only way to do it. And I didn't want to I didn't want to run long, so I sort of skipped over a little bit of the detail in there. But you can actually use a logistic regression model to calculate a probability of turnout and then use a cutoff on that. So that particular method um, doesn't, uh, of making a probability as opposed to a point on a, on a scale, doesn't necessarily lead to one type or the other. But I've become convinced by evidence that I've seen in the voter file studies that we've done, where we've looked at, uh, at electorates after the fact, that it is a mistake to declare someone a non-voter um, in advance of the election. Um, I think that the proper way to do it is to weight people by their probability of voting, hope that you've calculated that accurately, and that way, everybody is bringing information into the, into the analysis. That's the approach that Nate Cohn is using with the New York Times surveys. Um, and I think that, that on balance, that's, that's a better approach. Uh, here's another uh, question that comes from the, the chat column. If Joe Biden is elected, uh, do you think that the 2022 turnout will be more similar to 2014 or more similar to 2018? Oh, man, what a question. <laughs> um, well, you know, our political science um, record suggests that presidents struggle in their first midterm election, that um, there's some buyer's remorse that problems don't get fixed fast enough. Um, and it's an, you know, because it's a democratic president and it's an off year, the built in advantages that Republicans tend to have um, in terms of older voters who have more established habits of turnout are probably going to benefit um, the Republicans all other things being equal. I'm not saying that you're going to have a situation like you had in 2010, which is, you know, the direct comparison to, let's say, Obama's first term. Um, and that was a wipeout for the Democrats. The turnout was pretty low and it was quite, um, it was quite Republican. There, there was a backlash to the Affordable Care Act and lots of issues. Um, I would say it may have a lot to do with whether the Democrats are able to capture the Senate and be able to uh, pursue their policy goals um, and whether those policy goals pursued actually produces results that um, help to mitigate some of the economic damage that we're seeing now, not to mention getting us out of the, out of the pandemic. I mean, all of that is just very hard to, to speculate about. So when, uh, based upon your uh, knowledge of other people's work or when you were doing these pre-election estimates yourself at Pew, um, did you model voter preference separately for those uh, who will vote by mail or those who will vote in person? Well, we, we didn't um, in the sense of modeling them, but we, we did ask people um, periodically how they how they intended to vote. Um, and as we got closer to the election, we asked people not only did they intend to vote, but had they already voted? And if they said they had already voted, either by early voting in person or by mail, 
we tend to, you know, our, our rule was to count them as a likely voter with certainty. So we haven't modeled separately, but um, it's an interesting question and it might be something that, that uh, careful pollsters will need to, to think about in this election where uh, early voting is apt to be the majority. I mean, I think it was already about 40% in 2016 and it's apt to be bigger than that this year probably by a lot one one uh, potential co complication for turnout in the fall uh which you alluded to in a different way uh might be what some people are calling voter suppression efforts uh which are deliberate attempts to constrain turnout especially in urban areas Will that be a problem for pre-election pollsters to take into account? I think it's impossible to, to know, and thus by definition, it is a, it is a problem taking it into account. If it happens um, at any scale, I don't see how it could be anticipated and accurately um, gauged for purposes of um, forecasting turnout. Um, I, I'm I'm sure uh, that pollsters are going to be looking very closely at all the signs that they can find uh, as to whether there's any kind of systematic campaigns designed to discourage uh, people from voting. Um, just as I think they're going to be looking at the machinery and seeing if the states are are able to come up to speed, um, the election administration offices and the like. But I think it's just kind of an unknown at this point. I, I certainly wouldn't know exactly how to do it. Um, do we have uh, any additional questions from uh, uh, participants? I give you a, a, a short period of time to get your question, type your questions in. Uh, my general sense as a person who studies, you know, uh, elections and also pre-election polling is that this is going to be a very difficult uh, election for the pre-election pollsters because the interpersonal dynamics uh, in a period of political polarization uh, are so, uh, have so sharply drawn the lines and uh, the issue of the, the mechanisms available to local election officials to, to run uh, elections in a reliable audit-like fashion are under a great deal of stress. Um, I think my, my, one of my own views is that um, the, that the Republican Party is trying to run out the clock on implementing uh, any kind of voting by mail system, uh, which is on the one hand relatively straightforward, but also requires very careful advanced planning. It's not as though I mean, first of all, we don't have national elections, right? We have a series of state and local elections held on the same day. And it's not as though uh, an election administrator could decide uh, the third week in October that they were gonna go to a vote by mail system. That has to be in place by uh, the beginning of September, I believe, in order to make appropriate arrangements, including, for example, printing ballots. So if, we don't have a systematic movement towards voting by mail in the next few weeks, including an appropriation by the Congress to support a vote by mail election. It's, it's uh, unlikely to happen. We'll have to see how much, uh, especially the Democrats in Congress can do uh, to try to support uh, a vote by mail system across the country just as they appropriated money after 2000 to help states buy new machinery, you were going to you were going to 
say something, Scott. Well, I, I was also going to make make this observation, which is that the the election machinery is definitely challenged, and I think I agree with everything that you've said there. It's going to vary a lot by state. <clears throat> it isn't necessarily going to. I mean, we we it, you know we might think that it's going to disadvantage the Democrats uh, because Democrats. Um, may be more wary about the coronavirus at this point, at least polling suggests that to be the case. But at the same time, Republicans have traditionally taken better advantage of voting by mail. And if there are efforts to restrict its, its extension, um, it's not clear to me what the partisan effects are gonna be. But there is one aspect of the current situation with the coronavirus that does seem to have clear partisan implications. And that is that um, the democratic base, particularly uh, in younger Americans, um, is a group of people who need um, mobilization more than older people do. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, younger people don't know as much about how to, how to participate uh, the rules, they're subject to more complicated situations because of being away at college or not being away at college, but, but being registered to vote at the town where they're normally in college. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole crop of new 18 year olds every day um, who may or may not be getting registered. I mean, the indications from the voter file companies is that, that the um, new registrations are down very substantially. And part of that is that the kind of canvassing and door knocking and other um, mass efforts that um, you know Democrats might be doing now at concerts and places like that, and that the Trump campaign might be doing at his own rallies, uh, are on hold right now. And I think that's something that could definitely affect the Democratic turnout because they're just not going to have the kind of uh, boots on the ground mobilization that is a part of, a necessary part of, of their efforts. And uh, you made an allusion to this in your presentation. It's a point that uh, Dan made in his presentation. Uh, this would, could be the first time uh, in several cycles where we won't have a declared winner on election night because the slowness in tabulating all of these absentee ballots and uh, uh, mail-in ballots uh, is going to be quite slow, as well as the length of lines and the time at which polls will have to stay open conceivably. So it's, it's going to be a different experience for Americans, and it's going to be a different experience for pollsters in terms of evaluating the success of their, of their pre-election work. Completely agree. Well, on that somber note, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you, Scott, for a real interesting uh, presentation. Um, Scott has also sent us a copy of his uh, slides. When we get to uh, uh, putting materials up on YouTube, uh, in addition to the video, we'll also have his, uh, present his presentation available as well. Th thank you very much, Scott, for being with us this evening. Thank you. I enjoyed it myself very much.